Hello, my name is Isabartha, and I'd like to welcome you to the second installment in a two-part series on World War I. I have a master's degree in history from the University of Central Florida, and I've been professor of history and humanities at Seminole State College and Valencia College in Orlando, Florida for 13 years. In our first installment on this video series on World War I, we talked about the foundations of problems that came to Europe by the early 20th century. Most notably, the unification of Germany and the destabilization of a balance of power system over in Europe until there were a fatal set of alliances that had been made. Now Germany had as a result of unification in 1871, Germany had become the most powerful military power and economic power in Europe. Germany could single-handedly defeat any European, any European nation. France, Italy, Austria, Russia, Germany could stand up to any of these nations and defeat them militarily in a conflict. However, a coalition of alliances would cause a war on two fronts that would be impossible for Germany to win. The nightmare scenario for Germany had been a war on two fronts of a military alliance between France and Russia. The German military high command had been dreading this through the late 19th century and into the 20th century. In our previous lecture, we talked a little bit about the so-called Schlieffen Plan, which we'll go into more details about, especially in its execution. Now, by 1914, Germany had become feeling very isolated in Europe, with only one true ally that it felt it could count on, and that was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But a fatal sequence of events had erupted on June 28, 1914, when the Archduke of Austria, Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated in Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia in Austria-Hungary. Now, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the Emperor of Austria, Austria was now, since 1867, a dual monarchy, power split with the Hungarian kingdom, so that the Emperor of Austria was also King of Hungary. But the Austrian Emperor was Franz Joseph, and he was 85 years old. Franz Ferdinand was the Archduke, the position second only to Emperor. And when Franz Joseph, whom most Austrians felt would die very soon, Franz Ferdinand would become the new Emperor. But the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and his wife on June 28, 1914, set in sequence a series of events that no European power was prepared for or understood the repercussions of which. So Serbia, a small country to the southeast of Austria-Hungary, had been bitter at Austria-Hungary for quite some time. Serbia had been hoping to expand its boundaries into a South Slav or Yugoslav kingdom or power in this region of Europe that we call the Balkans. Now, after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the Austro-Hungarian intelligence forces learned that there was a terrorist organization called the Black Hand that was responsible for this assassination, and that the Black Hand also had ties to the Serbian government. So Austria-Hungary gave Serbia a set of ultimatums, 12 ultimatums, of which Serbia agreed to the first 11, but refused the 12th, which would grant power to Austria-Hungary of the entire police force in Serbia. This being said, Austria-Hungary declared that it would start a war with Serbia if this condition was not met. But a trigger network of alliances went Russia declaring it would back Serbia, France declaring it would back Russia, 
Germany declaring that it would back Austria Hungary. And one by one, the European nations fell like a tripwire system until all of Europe by June 29, 1914, was at a state of war. The military powers of Europe were divided into two groups. Those countries allied to Germany, shown here in blue, become known as the Central Powers. Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and Ottoman Turkey. In yellow would become the Entente or Allied Powers, including France, Russia, Serbia, and later in the conflict, Italy, Romania, Greece, and Portugal. Britain was a special case, as we shall see. Now, by 1914, Germany, fearing of a Franco-Russian coalition against it, Germany felt there was only one way that it could win a war on two fronts. In a Franco-Russian military alliance against Germany, seemingly Russia, which was such a larger power, would theoretically take longer to defeat than France. And so Germany had developed a military plan called the Schlieffen Plan in order to knock France out of the war rapidly so that Germany could then concentrate on the long conflict that it felt would happen with Russia. But Prussia, the German state that had unified Germany in 1871, had attacked France in the south in an area known as Alsace-Lorraine. And they felt the French would be expecting another attack in this region. So Germany developed a special plan of operations called the Schlieffen Plan. And the Schlieffen Plan called for a lightning maneuver to strike rapidly through Belgium and then attack France from the north to sweep around Paris from the west and encircle the French armies. The problem was the march through neutral Belgium. The European system of alliances that had gone back to the 19th century, you could not, according to the rules of diplomacy of the 19th century, simply violate a nation's neutrality. But Germany felt it had no other solution to a military problem to defeat France and Russia simultaneously. When Germany thus invaded neutral Belgium, this outraged another European power that could have been a balance of power between the central powers and the Entente or Allied powers. This was Great Britain, but Great Britain was infuriated by the violation of Belgian neutrality and declared war against Germany and its Austro-Hungarian ally in 1914. So in the summer of 1914, the Germans struck into Belgium. But something else the Germans did not expect happened also over in Belgium. And that is that the Belgians fought like lions. They fought with courage, bravery, and slowed down the German timetable. By the time the Germans had emerged into northern France, the French had enough time to move their military forces. The Germans struck down with full force, ultimately hitting the Marne River. But French military forces were prepared and had set up a defensible perimeter, especially with the slowdown that the Belgians had thrust upon the German forces. By the fall of 1914, the Germans were unable to pierce the Marne River defensive line, and the German advance was halted. The German advance was halted, and both powers tried to outflank each other until the military forces reached the sea. By the time that the forces of Germany and France had reached the sea, a stalemate would emerge in the Western Front, a stalemate that would last for the next four years. And for the next four years, neither Germany nor France would be able to break the stalemate of trench warfare. 
We will talk about what warfare was like on that Western Front in a little while. A decisive variable, however, would emerge in the eventual involvement of the United States in this conflict. We call it now World War I. At the time, it was simply called the Great War. There had never been a conflict of this large a scale in European history. The United States was a neutral nation at the beginning of World War I. And most Americans wanted America to stay out of this conflict. But unlike World War II, there were plenty of Americans that sympathized with Germany and Austria-Hungary, just as there were those that sympathized with Great Britain and France. The president was Woodrow Wilson, and Wilson felt that Germany was a militaristic power and personally sympathized with the more democratic governments of Britain and France. But American neutrality would be tested by a new German military technology, one of many that we will talk about. And this new technology was the submarine. Now, the submarine uh, was one of the weapons that remained very much untested in World War I. In World War II, the submarine was vulnerable to detection through radar and sonar. In World War I, there were no technologies of this type. And so a submarine, or U-boat, U-boat from the German Unterseeboot, a U-boat or submarine, if it is submerged with that little periscope above the waves, that submarine is invisible. Now, it is through use of the submarine that Germany hoped to knock out one of its enemies from this war, and that was Great Britain. Britain, being an island, had to import everything, including all of its resources and all of its food. It was thus vulnerable. And the Germans felt that if they could cut off the route of supplies to Great Britain, Great Britain would be strangled and would make peace with Germany and opt out of this conflict. Germany thus sought, by the use of the submarine, to practice a new type of warfare at sea. They call this unrestricted submarine warfare. And by this, the Germans declared in the Atlantic Ocean that any ship was vulnerable to German attack if the Germans felt that this ship was carrying supplies or weapons to Great Britain. 1914 passed into 1915 until an incident happened on May the 7th of 1915 when a British passenger vessel known as the Lusitania was torpedoed by the, Brit by the Germans. The Lusitania was a, was a British passenger vessel that had about 1,200 people on it, including 128 Americans. The Germans proclaimed that the Lusitania was a military target, that it was actually, according to German intelligence, was carrying arms and materials of supply to Great Britain. But the 128 American citizens that died in the Lusitania when that ship went down, America was outraged and said that this was a weapon this was not a military target. Uh, this was not a valid target that uh, the Germans had hit. German intelligence maintained that this was indeed uh, carrying weapons. The situation was not exactly uh, declassified until after World War II in the 1950s. Uh, in the end, it turned out that Lusitania was carrying arms and material for, for, uh, for Great Britain from the United States. But in any event, the United States was infuriated by the sink of the Lusitania and the killing of these 128 American citizens. 
And the United States declared to Germany that unless Germany immediately cease unrestricted submarine warfare, that the United States would declare war on Germany. Now, this is the factor that most people confuse about the Lusitania incident. When the Germans heard this threat made by the United States, the Germans responded, we will stop unrestricted submarine warfare. The Germans will do whatever they must do to keep the United States out of this conflict. The United States wants Germany to stop unrestricted submarine warfare. Fine, said the Germans. They will stop it. The Germans did not want the United States as their enemy. So let's talk briefly about how the United States would come into this conflict, because it would be a decisive variable and a variable that would turn the tide of war ultimately against the Germans. Now, 1916 would go by, 1917 would go by, and Germany was unable to secure the victory that it expected it would be able to secure against Britain, France, and Russia, also the Italians in the South. Now, the United States had thus did its best to remain neutral in this conflict. For the presidential election year of 1916, President Woodrow Wilson had won re-election based on the slogan, he kept us out of war. But as 1916 and 1917 passed, with Germany no longer able to secure victory on its other fronts, the German military command felt that it was only a matter of time before the United States would get involved in this conflict. By early 1917, the Germans decided that it had to strangle Great Britain while it still had time. And in 1917, the Germans resumed unrestricted submarine warfare. On March 1917, five American passenger vessels were sunk by the Germans, killing 66 Americans. And this outraged the United States. But coupled with this was a terrible diplomatic blunder on the side of the Germans. And this is a telegram the Germans sent to Mexico called the Zimmerman Telegram. The Zimmerman Telegram was a secret telegram that the Germans sent to Mexico proposing that if the Mexicans join Germany, join the German side, and attack the United States from the south, that Germany will make sure that after the war and after a German victory in this conflict, Germany will make sure that Mexico gets back. Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico from the United States. Folks, Mexico is not going to attack the United States. And American intelligence had intercepted this telegram before the Mexicans even got it. But this had outraged the United States even further. And thus, coming before Congress and declaring that the world must be made, quote, safe for democracy. Woodrow Wilson had an easy time getting a declaration of war against Germany through Congress. And on April 5th of 1917, America joined Great Britain and France in the Allied effort against the Germans. Now, I'd like to talk at this point a little bit about how the war basically progressed, especially on the Western Front in World War I. Now, 
Now, the problem in World War I is that new technologies had emerged that had been untested on the battlefield. The general idea is that the new technologies of the age outclassed the tactics that could be used to counter these weapons. These would include the submarine, aircraft, aircraft that initially used for reconnaissance, but then for military purposes, uh, also poison gas, a horror on the Western Front. Yes, the Germans used it first, but the British and the French also used poison gas. Gas that could sear your lungs for the rest of your life, or even dissolve the membranes of the eyes. But the decisive weapon for which there was no way to counter was the machine gun. Now previously, in the conflicts of the 19th century, such as the American Civil War, the weapon had been the musket and the rifle. And well dug in position to get off a few shots at the enemy. If I were standing in a military line for Union soldiers in the Civil War with a few subordinates, and a rebel attack was coming from a couple of hundred yards, probably with our weapons, kill or wound anywhere from about five to 10, maybe 12 Confederates. The machine gun changed all that. Now, with a well dug in machine gun, advancing soldiers could be mown down by the hundreds, by the thousands. There was no way for foot soldiers, infantry, to counter the machine gun. The basic scenario is what is called trench warfare that I would like to explain on the Western Front. If you have, in the front, well dug in machine gun positions, and these are attacked by enemy soldiers closing in, Enemy soldiers can be mown down by these machine guns, and they are absolutely helpless against them. So the other side would begin to build trenches of, of their own. And yet enemy counters, again, now from the other side, would be massacred by entrenched machine gun positions. There was no way to counter the machine gun in World War I. But nobody knew that this was going to happen. Nobody knew that this was going to be the result of a machine gun. And so, we have two powers. Northern France, Germans, against the French with the British allies, in opposing trenches. In this model I'm showing you over here, possibly, we'd say this is about a mile to half a mile. Razor sharp barbed wire on either side. And for the next four years, horrific trench warfare with a loss of life more than anything that had ever been seen in human history. Soldiers being massacred back and forth over yards of mud on the battlefield by the tens of thousands, by hundreds of thousands. Western Front was a terrible place to fight. It meant rats everywhere, lice infestation, Sometimes your feet in ice cold water, so you could uh, develop a condition called trench foot, which the flesh slid off the bones in worst cases as well. And there was no way to counter the machine gun. This stagnation would remain 
in the war through the first, all four years of this conflict. I wish to tell the story of several of the major battles that were fought in World War I. And the most horrific of the battles were fought in 1916, one against the French and one against uh, the British. The French at Verdun and the British at the Somme. The Battle of Verdun in 1916 The front line situation, the small town of Verdun, was about a mile or so behind the front. And in 1916, the German military command decided that it would attack Verdun relentlessly. No matter how many days or weeks went by, the Germans decided they will not relinquish the attack. That they would continue to attack, no matter how many tens of thousands, no matter how many hundreds of thousands of German soldiers were massacred at the front, the Germans maintained they would not give up the attack. Unfortunately, and unknown to the Germans, the French had the opposite plan in mind. The French decided that they would not give up the defense, that no matter how many French lives were lost, no matter how many tens of thousands, no matter how many hundreds of thousands of French soldiers were lost, the French would not give up the defense. And so, over a period of weeks, a few months, at Verdun, over a million men massacred. Nobody gained or lost any territory in the Battle of Verdun. Men massacred over 1.2 million killed or wounded. This happened also to the Germans and the British at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. By 1917, both sides were exhausted. Now, interestingly, if the stalemate was the general situation on the Western Front, on the Eastern Front, the Germans were much more successful against Russia. And the Germans had an idea, if they could help create a revolution in Russia, this could serve the German military cause. Now, Russia was in a state of potential military chaos. And also, the monarchy, Tsar Nicholas II over as the Tsar of Russia, a communist insurgency had been active for quite some time in Russia. Living in exile in Switzerland, was a communist revolutionary by the name of Vladimir Lenin. And the Germans hoped that by sending Lenin into Russia, that he could help develop revolution in the Russian Empire. And so Lenin was given secret transport from Switzerland into Russian-controlled Finland, where he began a successful revolution in Russia. Now, the war was more mobile on the Eastern Front, the Germans against the Russians. But by 1917, the Russian Revolution was gaining tremendous success. And finally, the communists came to power. But they needed to secure their revolution. They needed to secure it. And these communist revolutionaries wanted to get out of the war one way or the other. And so they sought a peace agreement with the Germans. But the German demands 
were high indeed. Germany demanded that the only peace that Germany would sign would be if Russia surrendered vast territories. The Ukraine, Yellow Russia, present-day Belarus, the Baltic states, Finland, Crimea, and the oil-rich region of the Caucasus. These German demands were extreme, but the Russians wanted out of this war no matter what. And in March of 1918, the Russians surrendered these territories. So Germany was now victorious on the Eastern Front. Russia had been successfully knocked out of the war. But with this, now, hundreds of thousands of German troops were now free to fight in the West. And Germany hoped over the summer of 1918 to have a final lightning blow on the Western Front before the Americans could get to France in numbers enough. And so, in the summer of 1918, the German soldiers struck, and the lines, the front line broke, and the Germans advanced 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 35 miles, and then petered out. And the Americans had now arrived. Now, the German forces, the German soldiers on the Western Front were exhausted from four years of warfare. So were the British, so were the French soldiers. Morale was low, battle fatigue, shell-shocked soldiers, but the Americans were fresh. Their morale was intact. They had not seen combat. American aid with the British and the French began in the fall of 1918 with a major offensive against the Germans. The Germans were pushed back about 25, 30 miles to a front line here that you can see this dark line. Now this map shows the military situation over in the west. Uh, yellow being Belgium and France and blue being Germany. Now the American supported advance had only pushed Germans back uh, 25, 30 miles or so. But Germany's allies were facing dire straits indeed in the rest of the areas of conflict. The Ottoman Turkish state collapsed the British offensives in North Africa and in the Middle East. Bulgaria dropped out of the conflict and Austria-Hungary began to descend into political chaos. The German military command assessed the situation and decided that it could not successfully maintain this conflict for much longer and that peace must be sought. And so, peace proposals went out to Britain, France, and America for an armistice. An armistice. And what is an armistice? It is an agreement to stop fighting. It's not a win or lose situation. An armistice is simply an agreement to stop fighting. Now, the reasons that the Germans agreed to this armistice were very much because of the American president, Woodrow Wilson, and his peace proposals. Woodrow Wilson was a very educated man. He had a PhD in history uh, from Columbia University. He was a history professor. Wilson came up with some ideas 
for a peace solution to the military problems and ethnic problems of Europe. 14 points he declared and that the nations of Europe should and would be accorded what he called self-determination that a fair just and even peace would be used to settle the problems of Europe that it caused the Great War, the world First World War, in the first place. And so Germany agreed to this armistice, and an armistice was declared on November 11, 1918. But the peace process would turn out to be very, very uneven. The basic scenario that would emerge with the peace process, um, the Treaty of Paris, and the, the individual uh, peace treaties that were worked out with the individual European powers. An alliance with Turkey, the Treaty of Trianon with Hungary, the Treaty of St. Germain with Austria, and most important for our purposes, the Treaty of Versailles with Germany. Now, if Wilson proposed and argued that all the peoples of Europe would be accorded self-determination based on his system of 14 points, it would turn out to be a very uneven peace. If you had any affiliation with the Allies, you tended to do very well at the peace conference. And if you had any allegiance to Germany, you did not. The map of Europe was radically redrawn with these peace treaties. Most important to our purposes is the Treaty of Versailles. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was completely dismantled. Austria and Hungary reduced to very, very small states. Germany actually not making out so bad as the Nazis would later make it out to be, but yet, the Germans lost territory in the east to a resurrected Poland. Poland has an unfortunate habit of appearing and disappearing from the map of Europe throughout European history. The Poles have always been in a very unfortunate situation and that Poland has no national boundaries, no major mountains or rivers that could be used to create strong boundaries. And also, Poland has the single most aggressive military power on one side of it, Prussia, which became Germany, and the second most aggressive military power on the other side, which would be Russia. But Poland was reborn with the peace treaties of World War I. Also, the Serbs finally achieved their dream of a South Slav or Yugoslav state. A state that would be comprised of Slavic language peoples of Southern Europe, that would include the Slovenes, Croats, Bosnian Muslims, Montenegrins, and Serbs. But Yugoslavia from the 1920s through the 1930s was often more of an extension of Serbia than a truly multinational state. Romania had gambled on an Allied victory and in 1916 had attacked Austria-Hungary. Romania had tripled in size. Actually, Romania got a bigger piece of Hungary than Hungary got with the peace treaties of World War I. Another power, the Czechs. The Czechs, another Slavic language speaking people, of Central Europe have never had their own state. But they had often been bitter to the Austrian Germans that had claimed power of, of 
their people for hundreds of years. They were considered to be an allied people by the British and the French and the Americans, and were given their own state. Expanded with a region of Hungary called Slovakia. The Slovakians and Czechs do speak a language that is similar to one another, both of them being Slavic languages. But there the similarities stopped. The Slovakians also never really had their own state, but were part of the Hungarian kingdom. Indeed, the Slovak economy was based on timber and supplies going through the rivers of Hungary into the Hungarian mainland. But the Czechs were given control of this in a new Czechoslovak state. The Czechs cut off the supply and demand relationship that existed between the Slovaks and the Hungarians. This devastated the Slovak economy. But the Germans also lost territory in the West. Alsace-Lorraine, that region conquered by the Germans from the French in 1871, which we focused so much in the previous installment. Everybody knew that was going back to France. But the Rhineland would be demilitarized, and some small bits of territory lost to Belgium, uh, Denmark, and to Poland in the east. But another factor would anger the Germans tremendously. The Treaty of Versailles stipulated that Germany was responsible for World War I. The so-called war guilt clause of the Treaty of Versailles stated that Germany was responsible for this conflict. Germany was outraged with this, with, with this proposal. Did not the varied European powers not stumble into this conflict? Just as France was embittered by the losses of the Franco-Prussian War, the Germans were infuriated by the peace processes of World War I. Just as the French yearned for revenge, now the Germans yearned for revenge as well. Another vision of President Woodrow Wilson would be the creation of a new League of Nations, a diplomatic entity that would make warfare obsolete. The League of Nations was created, and virtually all powers of the globe in the 1920s joined the League of Nations. But there's an interesting contradiction to the peace process at Versailles and the League of Nations. The United States had, by and large, created the Versailles Treaty. Yet the United States, the United States Senate, refused to allow the United States to sign the Treaty of Versailles. And the League of Nations, created by Woodrow Wilson and the United States, to which almost all nations of the world joined immediately after the conflict, with one exception, the United States, which had created the League of Nations in the first place. Tensions were bad. Tensions were worse than they had been with the destabilization of Europe in 1871 that we talked about with the Franco-Prussian War. Now, the Germans yearned for revenge. And also, when economic chaos struck Germany in the late 1920s and the 1930s and the Great Depression, Germans want a solution to unemployment and hunger. And this would lead to the Nazis taking power in Germany in the 1930s. Casualties from the First World War were horrific beyond anything that had ever been seen before in European history. The Germans, at the end of the conflict, 4.2 million men had been wounded, over 2 million dead. Austria-Hungary, 1.1 million dead. France, 1.4 million. Russia, 1.8 million dead. Italy, 650,000. The 
Great Britain, 885,000. The United States, only having about 116,000 dead since it had entered the conflict very late. Overall totals, 21 million people, 20 million dead in World War I. Half of those losses were civilians. But those losses would pale in comparison to the Second World War, which would come about only 20 years or so later. Most historians believe that World War I simply antagonized Europe worse than it had ever been. And losses in World War II would be unimaginable. Over 120 million people killed or wounded in World War II. Thank you.